Hi, thanks for tuning in. This is Sophie with our very first Ask Sophie Answer. I am so excited to basically respond to a very, very dear friend who asked me such a such a deep question that I, I really wanted to take some time and research this really, really well. <laughs> I have known Emily since forever, like forever, forever. Um, she's actually an expat like me, an American living overseas. And we've always had so much in common. And I'm just thrilled to be able to hopefully help her with something that is very near and dear to her heart. And that is sex and chronic illness. So Emily is a Sex with Sophie member. And all members are able to submit video, text, or audio questions to my Ask Sophie portal. And Emily is one of my first members to do so. And so this is how I want to respond to these moving forward. I have several more in queue that I'm excited to get to, but just uh, let's see how this first one goes. <laughs> Basically, what Ask Sophie is, is tapping into my ability to research and, and sift through uh, data to give an informed response to your question. I like to also talk to professionals who really get their input. This is also a, a means for me to open the door to you. If you have thoughts or, or a response that you feel is fitting, or if you just think this is pertinent to you, hopefully you'll join us in the forum on sexwithsophie.com and weigh in on how you felt my answer was. Was it sufficient? So let's just jump right into it. Emily asks, how do you navigate sex when you're chronically ill with a condition that greatly limits your energy and recovery? First of all, I really want to just issue my apologies to anyone dealing with any sort of chronic condition. It's not something that anyone asks for. It's not something that is is a load of fun. Um, and just in doing the research that I have with this, I didn't realize how much it actually impacts my own life. <laughs> um, I am obese. Uh, that's something that impacts my fertility. It impacts my my energy levels and all kinds of things. Um, and that's like the low end of the spectrum of chronic conditions. My husband has asthma. So it's something that, you know, and in researching some of the lung related, you know, issues, I'm actually like, oh, that actually, <laughs> that's stuff we can try. That's stuff that we're going to start implementing. I'm really excited to answer this question for Emily, but also for anyone who is suffering from a chronic illness or condition or someone who is a loved one, especially if you are the sexual partner of someone who has a chronic illness, or if you just want to be more informed. And also if you are a professional in the field and you deal with people who have chronic conditions, then again, please watch and weigh in on how you feel I did with answering Emily's question. So let's move on. Now, what exactly is a chronic illness. Um, it's basically uh, a condition or disability or a disease or an ailment that is long lasting and persistent. Not all the time is it permanent, but oftentimes, yeah, it's something that is irrevocable. It's not something that will ever go away. Almost 40% of Americans, that's 129 million people, are estimated to live with at least one chronic illness worldwide. If we <laughs> look at just how many people could potentially be affected with a chronic illness, it's pretty staggering. 42% of people have two or more chronic illnesses and 12% have at least five. And so these chronic diseases can look like, again, obesity, something that uh, a great deal of people have all the way to things that are uh, a lot more serious, I would say, some even life-threatening, of course, like cancer, cystic fibrosis, dementia, Alzheimer's. Some just cause discomfort or pain. Some have other symptoms that are a lot more long-lasting, so we'll talk about that as we move forward. Common chronic illnesses are heart disease, cancer, lung disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and kidney disease. Now, this is a stat that I included, but I really want to talk about for a second. Five of the top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. are preventable and treatable. I think that it lends 
an air of fault that is just not accurate or fair. Um, I've mentioned this before, and I don't know how often this will become relevant, but I'm very much a deterministic type person. I don't think that anything that is happening could have happened any differently than it's happening. And so for even something that seems pre preventable, like obesity, nobody wants to have a chronic disease or have obesity or have diabetes or any of the things that are, again, considered preventable or treatable. Well, treatable, sure, but preventable. I think that's the questionable word for me. So I, I really caution people who look at this data and say, oh, well, you know, we have to maybe discount or consider less valid those diseases or ailments that are preventable. Because if people had the means to not have these illnesses, they would do that. We need to look at the things that cause that person to be obese and consider are those leading and causal factors preventable. So for instance, say someone has a hormonal imbalance, maybe they don't have the financial capacity to, to pay for a gym membership. It could be that they live in a food desert that makes it very difficult for them to get healthy vegetables or fruit. So their only options are fast food or things that have more dense calories for cheaper prices. So we just don't know what's going on with people that led them to, I guess, acquire a condition that, again, could have been preventable. Even if that person woke up today and said, you know what, I don't want to be diabetic. I, I really don't want to have these, <laughs> these preventable illnesses. I'm going to start working out today and I'm going to get Ozempic, and I'm going to do all the things that I know I need to do. It's not like that person can snap their fingers and suddenly be, you know, thin or non-diabetic today. They could have just had barometric surgery a few weeks ago. They could have lost 100 pounds already. You just don't know uh, what that person has done or is doing because it's just not something that you can see the evidence of right away. So it's very, very unfair to critique people who not only do you not know why they're in a situation, but you don't know where they are along the journey of that particular situation. So again, that's my little soapbox about <laughs> the word preventable. I just don't want people to feel like as we move through discussions around these different uh, ailments, that anyone is, is less deserving of pleasure or happiness, or or sexual fulfillment, or or just fulfillment in their lives because they are dealing with something that was deemed again preventable. So let's have a lot more empathy with people as we move forward uh, in learning more about sex and chronic illness. So chronic illness it causes a wide variety of symptoms and scenarios that can hinder your sexuality. And the thing about chronic illness is that it doesn't even have to be the a diagnosed chronic illness for you to still have impacts from the symptoms that tend to occur from them. So for instance, the first one here talks about shortness of breath with lung diseases like cancer, COPD or emphysema, things like asthma, stuff like that. It's not limited to that. Say you're a smoker and you've never actually been diagnosed with any sort of problem, but you still deal with shortness of breath. Or if you're a little overweight or out of shape and you deal with shortness of breath, then hopefully some of these tips and tricks can help you regardless of whether or not you have actually been deemed a, a sufferer of a chronic illness. So let's look at just some ways that these symptoms can impact you if you have a chronic disease, but also if it's just stuff that you deal with that you might want some tips and tricks on for how to navigate when you're looking to um, be intimate. So incontinence, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, that's uh, a, a really common symptom, rigidity and stiffness from Parkinson's, arthritis, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, <laughs> lupus, uh, concerns about the presence of a colostomy bag or port or monitor, like a pacemaker um, or a diabetes glucose checker. You could have body dysphoria because you might be missing a limb, a testicle, a breast from cancer, 
or a mastectomy. You might have had a skin region removed from a melanoma. You can also just have lowered libido, vaginal dryness, erectile dysfunction, or just general tiredness and exhaustion because of a medication or, or a, a ramification from the illness itself. And finally, you could have physical pain or even just the fear that sex could be painful. All of these things can impact your sex life if you're dealing with a chronic illness or, again, symptoms that tend to present themselves with chronic illnesses, whether or not you've been diagnosed or not. So in all my research, the best thing that you can do is to accept that, unfortunately, this is just going to be the new normal. Now, one of the beautiful things about that is that even the new normal can change on a daily basis. Hopefully the trajectory is always towards health and and less or no pain or even towards not having your illness at all if 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 at all possible. But if not, it's it's still just something you have to wrap your mind around. So it's just something that we have to come to grips with, go through the the stages of of loss and grief around what our pictures of our lives were in the before times of our illness and try to come to grips with what life is going to be like moving forward. So to combat some general symptoms of chronic illness, mindfulness is extremely important. Now, when I say mindfulness, sometimes What comes to mind for me is like meditating in a corner for hours in in the dark. I don't know why, Um, but (laughs) it's really not about that. It's really more so about really understanding your body, your internal state, what physical and mental symptoms are happening within yourself. Basically, uh, proprioception or what's known as like kinesthesia, having a good sense of your own body. I was excited to see that it could be as simple as eating lunch And just being more mindful about your chewing and your mastication (laughs) and, you know, how the food feels in your mouth and what it feels like to swallow, taking your time to really understand your body and just have points throughout the day where you're putting on your shoes, where you're really just being cognizant of of every step that it takes to make what is normally um, kind of a rote movement. So I love that you can achieve mindfulness without having to become like a yoga master (laughs) and intimacy. Some people tend to conflate intimacy and sex. And yes, intimacy can and does often lead to sex. But, you know, especially if you're dealing with a chronic illness, it's something that you want to start implementing in your relationship just for the sake of it, not necessarily for it to, to always lead to sex. Amping up the intimacy in your relationship is something that I'm seeing in the research as really helping to bridge that gap between some of the loss that occurs when you're unable to actually go all the way or have the full uh, act of intercourse. You can really still maintain that connection with your partner via holding hands, touching, sure, cuddling, snuggling, all the, that fun stuff. But also by watching a movie together, spending quality time, you know, when you're not together sending nice text messages and, and, and sexting little or leaving nice notes for your partner, maintaining that sort of all day foreplay. And if you've heard the Black Lesbians episode of the Sex with Sophie podcast, you'll know all about that. <laughs> Have a listen because you'll learn about foreplay and just how to really inject some intimacy in your relationship. Nobody does it better than lesbians, okay? Lastly, kindness. Try to do something nice for your part- partner every day if you can. That's within your means and within your ability. Again, whether it's just doing the dishes or, or taking something off their hands or leaving a nice note or sending them a gift. Really try to amp up how empathetic and, cu- and, and just nice you're being to the person who's also had their world uh, turned upside down a little bit by what you're going through. Also, you want to do some physical things as well as all that, the mindfulness, intimacy, kindness. I think that's more of like an internal thing. But as far as the physical, tangible things you can start to do, uh, really start to think about strengthening your pelvic floor. You'll be able to have sex without doing as much work. (laughs) So practicing Kegel exercises and really strengthening your core are really good ways to help your genitalia do the work that your 
body would have been doing otherwise, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, I'm seeing a lot of good research articles allude to this being helpful when it comes to mitigating tiredness and exhaustion, because again, it just it just takes the muscular strain off of you because you're doing more of the work with your core. I use the Parafit system and it's amazing. So if you're a woman or if you have a vagina, you might want to look into this because it is so fun. <laughs> it's basically like a little device. It looks like a dildo, but it's just a like a sensor and you put it up your vagina and then you get your phone out and you play these really fun games. Um, so you have to like squeeze your Kegel muscles <laughs> to get this little fish to go through a hoop or whatever. And then you un unsqueeze it. So he'll go down and, and it's just really, really, really engaging and really fun. And it's a great way to strengthen your Kegel muscles, but also to kind of gauge just how well you're progressing with strengthening them. So I would check it out. I don't know if there's something like that for the gentleman, but you too have Kegels that you can certainly practice strengthening. So I would definitely look into that more, sir <laughs> or madam. Uh, you also want to start tracking your symptoms, uh, whether you use the app that comes with your phone, Apple Health. I'm sure Samsung and Google have things, but you can absolutely just use what's at hand. If there's an app that's specific to your ailment, if it's like arthritis or, or asthma, and you want to find a corresponding app for that or a website for that, sure, go ahead. But even if you just get your notes app and just start tracking on a daily basis, not only your physical symptoms, but your mental state, it's a really good way to help you move into the next steps, which is planning. So you want to try to get a good feel for when the best time of day is appropriate for you to have sex. Maybe it's that you have the most energy in the mornings. Maybe it's that the evenings are better for you because you wake up feeling a little stiff or sore. Maybe it's a different time of the month, maybe hormonally or depending on the mood. <laughs> Who knows? Some people actually report arthritis symptoms are, are worse during a full moon. Start to track how you're feeling throughout the day and of course throughout the weeks and months so you can start to get a good picture of when is best to start planning to have sex. And yes, it doesn't sound very fun, but you need to start putting on the calendar when you want to engage in sexual activity. As, as sterile as that feels, it's something that can actually really help to give you something to look forward to. And again, plan around when that time comes um, because you can do things like plan to take your medications. If you're dealing with pain, uh, what's recommended is to, to take it 30 minutes before in, engaging in sex. You can do some stretches. You can plan to do any exercises that your doctor might have prescribed or physiotherapist might have recommended. So those are things to help you limber up a little bit. And again, you'll know when to schedule those out for if you plan in advance. Also a warm Epsom salt bath. You, you can plan to do that beforehand. And if things don't work out, once you get down to the time and designated hour, <laughs> you know, just be flexible with it. I read a story about a woman who had her lingerie on and she was ready to go and then she had explosive diarrhea. <laughs> so poor baby. Just like in that case, shit happens. So you have to, you know, just kind of keep a positive outlook about it and roll with the punches. So once her episode ended, she was able to get back to it, which is fine. But if you're not wanting to jump in or if the episode or, or thing you're experiencing is too much, that's okay to stop. But that's when you really want to pump up again, that intimacy with your partner, take the time to just cuddle and talk and really try to build that quality time with each other. If you're, even if you're unable to have sex, uh, some more general tips are around communication. You want to really share your anxieties with your partner because if they can't read your mind, they won't know unless you tell them. And also you want to understand maybe what their anxieties are. I was reading about a couple where the guy would ask, you know, hey, are you, how are you feeling? Are you okay? His partner would say, oh, I'm, I'm just so tired. And he immediately 
was like, oh, well, I'm not going to bother you. It's not that she didn't want sex. The conversation didn't even get that far. He just assumed that she was too tired to do anything. And so in his trying to be supportive and, and you know, respectful of her, he was missing opportunities. And so was she. He had anxieties around doing things that she might not have been ready for. Um, another thing you want to do is pregame the conversation. Don't have it when you're right about to play. <laughs> Don't have it in bed. Don't have it when you're about to have sex. Again, in that planning, sit down in a coffee shop somewhere. Just if you have a regular family meeting, really eke out some time to talk about these things before you're trying to think about intimacy or think about sex. Know and reassess your love languages. Gary Chapman wrote a book, The Five Love Languages. So if you haven't read it and don't know yours, I highly recommend checking that book out and then looking at how knowing what your love language is, it might need to shift or adjust considering your chronic illness. Um, let me give you an example. If your love language is physical touch, but now you are dealing with a, a lot more pain, a lot more sensitivity from your illness, you might not like to be touched or touched in certain areas that you might've liked previously. So now that you are aware of this, you can start to reassess your love language. And perhaps now you, you have your partner touch different areas or you, again, try to understand when you're feeling less pain and work to have sex in those moments. Or again, just try to amp up that intimacy level so that it's not so much about the touch when it comes to the sexual act, but you're you're maintaining that touch at intimate moments. Let's say that your uh, love language is acts of service, but now you have a debilitation where it makes it more difficult for you to cook dinner or to clean up or to um, take your partner on a walk. Um, there's, <laughs> or to take a walk with your partner. They're not a dog, I'm sure. Order out, have a cleaning service come in, go to a movie or go somewhere where you're not having to do the entertaining. I really, really like this one. Uh, you want to develop a mating call. <laughs> I think this one is fantastic because basically whenever you are ready for sex, like for instance, with the, with the couple where the guy said, hey, are you tired? And he assumed, oh, she's tired. I'm not going to want to do anything with her. They actually developed a mating call. So she would just say, hey, are we going to have sex or what? <laughs> and he was like, okay. And that was their mating call. But yours doesn't have to be nearly that direct, you can perhaps rub your partner's leg when you're feeling amorous at night. Or again, if you're planning on it and, and now's the time, you can say TikTok or whatever it is that you two find endearing and that can, you know, really set it off for each other. Uh, go ahead and talk about that and get that set up so you can know what it is and, and do it. <laughs> um, also, you want to educate yourself and find community. Sex Interrupted was one of the top resources that I found. Um, it's a book by a registered nurse named Iris Zink, and it is extraordinary. I highly recommend getting it. If you go to sexwithsophie.com slash links, you can find it there along with some of the other resources that we'll mention. And I liked it because um, she's, first of all, she's the one who talked about the mating call, which I think was great. And also she was just, she was really perplexed with the, the dearth of research that had been done on this. And so she found across all kinds of different chronic conditions that there were almost 600 research papers that had discussed in some way, shape or form intimacy and sex. And so she put all that information together along with her experience as a nurse to write this book. And it's really, really great. So I highly recommend it. Also, Join sexwithsophie.com. You can join for free and join the chronic focus group. It's basically a place I've, I just created to try to give people suffering from disability and chronic illnesses a place to come and commune and talk about maybe some more tips and tricks that I'm missing. So definitely join for free and check it out. And now's my time to, to throw the questions right back at you. So you ask Sophie, but now Sophie asks, <laughs> what tips, tricks, and resources help you prepare for and navigate sex considering your chronic condition? So go to the forum, go to the Ask Sophie category and check out this answer. If you're not 
watching from here already and let us know how you navigate sex and your chronic illness. Now for some specific illnesses, chronic illnesses that had some really helpful tips, again, that could be helpful for the specific illness, but I think also in general are good things to keep in mind. Um, if you have heart disease, try not to eat a heavy meal or drink alcohol before sex because that could really mess with your blood pressure. Also a, a large, also a bloated stomach can impact you if you have a lung issue or breathing problems. So it's just good advice all around. If you have cancer or other uh, illnesses or treatments that you're undergoing that really, really diminish your energy, try to get help with your everyday activities. Um, that'll help you with your stress and with your energy level. So have somebody else pick up the kids, get a meal train going. Don't be afraid to send out for services and all kind of fun things. Get a Roomba <laughs> instead of <laughs> vacuuming all the time. Whatever you can do or however you can lean on your, your network, do so. If you have a bag or a port, try to avoid pressure or tension on your access site. But for the most part, I'm seeing that you shouldn't have any worries or problems with having sex. Um, if you've had a transplant, like a kidney transplant or a liver transplant, um, it's recommended to wait until the scars begin to heal, but definitely wait for your doctor to give the okay before engaging in sex. Now, if you had a, a much more um, aggressive transplant, like a lung transplant or heart transplant, you certainly want to um, get your doctor's approval before engaging in sexual activity. If you have kidney disease, a common side effect is erectile dysfunction and also vaginal dryness for, for ladies with vaginas or men with vagi vaginas. Um, it's very common. And so it's also very treatable, which is great. So talk to your doctor about some erectile dysfunction treatments or uh, lubricants um, or pills that you can take for vaginal dryness because there's stuff for that, which is neat. If you have diabetes, try to avoid alcohol. That's also something that can mess with your blood sugar because alcohol is basically sugar which is kind of wild. Um, also before sex, check your glucose and see if you need to have a snack and keep snacks handy while you're having sex, because, um, you know, it's okay to take a break and, <laughs> and have some chips or, or a candy bar. Um, if you're feeling a little like headed or, or, um, like your sugar's dropping. If you have arthritis, try a rolled up towel or pillow during sex to relieve some pain. And if you have dementia, try to avoid sex in the twilight hours, um, especially if you're experiencing sundowning. That is very common to Alzheimer's and dementia patients. Nobody really knows why, but yeah, as it gets starts to get closer to nighttime, that's when cognitive issues start to present themselves sometimes. Now for lung related chronic illnesses, there are so many tips. So I just wanted to talk about those specifically. Before sex, try to get a hold of a wearable O2 sensor like an Apple Watch or anything that can kind of help you keep track of, again, your oxygen levels. Um, if you have phlegm really bad, try to cough up as much as you can before engaging in sex. And also try to avoid morning sex because that tends to be when phlegm is at its worst. And don't be afraid to take one or two puffs of your inhaler before engaging in sex. And during sex, don't be afraid to take a puff of your inhaler if you need to. And also avoid weight on your chest and your diaphragm. So no positions where someone is on top of you, which is great because, you know, that opens up doggy style and cowboy and uh, or missionary, which is actually, I just learned, uh, the most popular sex act so or sex position so <laughs> you'll be in good company don't worry about it. and also don't be afraid to use any sort of oxygen masks or CPAP or uh, non-invasive ventilation systems that you might have on hand for nighttime or just for when you're having an, an episode don't be afraid to use that during sex talk to your partner about it if if they're comfortable give it a shot one of the things that I love, <laughs> you'll probably hear me say this a lot, but I love, love, love like period romance, dime store romance novels. And one of my favorite, favorite writers, um, my second favorite writer, Lisa Kleypas has a book called Devil in Disguise. And it's amazing. And as the, the dainty heiress of the shipping company from, you know, 1800s England is uh, bending over to receive... <laughs> 
the Scottish whiskey distiller who's, you know, captured her heart. Um, she turns around and she says to him, you know, I feel so uh, undignified, like presenting to you like this. And he was basically like, well, yeah, you know, sex is very undignified, but isn't that what makes it fun? And I was like, you know, I never really thought about it that way. And and ever since then, I've always I've thought of that passage uh, in regards to some of the silly things that happen during sex. Even just the, the act of sex in itself is just, it's, it's a silly, fun thing. And so um, I think we get misguided with media because sex on in movies and on TV is just so, oh, you know, it's so, mm, mm, it's so elevated to this other realm of romance and romanticism that um, just doesn't really exist in reality. It's really just a funny thing to do, isn't it? So, <laughs> so if you're adding an oxygen mask on, you know, try to have some fun with it or, or make fun fun of the fact that um, you might look a little silly, but hey, you're still having fun. <laughs> Take some regular breaks, change positions as you start to maybe feel tired or, or a little out of breath. My husband has asthma, and so that's something I, I notice we do, but I, I want to be more intentional about uh, making sure that we take breaks and just switch it up more when you're in the middle of things. Um, now, for professional assistance, and I definitely should have said this at the offset, but I am just a data chick. <laughs> I'm really good at researching my whole shtick is, you know, that I ha I know the data science. I have a master's degree in informatics. My background's in IT. That's me. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a clinician. I don't know those things. And so you will absolutely want to consult with your doctor and specialists, especially the ones who are managing your care to help guide this plan. Um, hopefully these are some helpful tips and whatnot, but you really do want to talk to the, the pros about um, how to move forward with sex in your chronic illness. Um, you want to talk to them about some of the unintended side effects of things as well. If you are dealing with anxiety and depression, talk to them about that. But also, you know, if you're taking medication for that, and maybe even some of the medications that you're taking for your uh, chronic condition, those things can really impact your libido and also your ability to have an orgasm. Bring that up. Let them know that if that's a concern for you. Also, if you're taking antibiotics due to your condition, you might be uh, more susceptible to yeast infections or UTIs. And thrush is just what they call a yeast infection in Europe, I learned. Also, incorporate a couples counselor, sexologist, or a sex therapist in your mental health repertoire, especially if they have the experience of um, or the niche of working with people with chronic conditions. They can really, really offer much more um, specific insight considering what you're dealing with in particular. Some other considerations to share with a professional are if your partner is also the one taking care of you because they're going to need some extra special love and attention and also just eyes on them to make sure they're doing okay. You always have to check on your strong friends. And if your partner is, you'll want to lift that up so that you can, again, better manage the plan that you're developing for yourself so it can be inclusive of them as well. Lastly, engage with the professionals who respond to this reply. So um, with sexwithsophie.com, we have some brand new, brand spanking new clinicians only memberships. Anybody that you see replying who has a little B badge is a person working in the field or working in a sex sexual health field. And so that person's insight is probably going to be a little bit better than mine. So uh, take their words to heart and have a listen to what they have to say. Clinicians, if you're watching this and you're like, hey, I've had a patient who dealt with this, or I know a little something about that, weigh in. Let me know. Like definitely go on to sexwithsophie.com, sign up for a clinician level membership. It's the B ones. We have Fairy B. Honeybee and Bumblebee level clinicians only members. We're really trying to build a cadre of people who are more knowledgeable than me. Because again, I am just a data check. And if you want to check my sources and my data, then here's where to find it. So these are my citations for this answer. I really and truly hope that this was helpful. I definitely 
want my friend Emily to let me know if this answered her question (laughs) and if uh, she has any additional follow-up questions from this. So comment below if you're already on the forum and this is where you're watching this, make sure you leave a comment to, again, offer your insights as a clinician or to offer your experiences as a person suffering from a chronic illness. We've also, again, got the chronic focus group that you will definitely want to join. And that way you can talk to people who are dealing with what you're dealing with and you don't have to worry about outside folks peeking in on your conversation. And then if you're watching this from YouTube, this is one of the few that I think is tame enough (laughs) that I can put on there. Um, My next uh, question that I'm answering is about penetrative orgasms. And so I don't think this one will make the cut. Um, for a public showing. But definitely, if you're watching from YouTube, you'll want to come onto sexwithsophie.com and join as a free member. That way you can engage with Ask Sophie. You can ask me questions or you can actually write and read what's going on in the comments section for this particular episode or for any of them in the forum. The forum is also the place to go to check out questions and, and information about some of the courses that are coming up. So it's a good place to go. It's a good place to be. We also have some really fun tools for paying members and get some additional podcasts, exclusive features, and also access to our guided masturbations, which are a very, very fun new audio program that we've just launched. So uh, yeah, that's it for me for this Ask Sophie. To ask me your own questions, Go to sexwithsophie.com, sign up for a free membership, and you can then ask any of your burning questions about sex or your questions about burning sex. (laughs) Again, I'm not a medical professional, but I'll do my best to research and find a thorough answer for you. And that's it for sex and chronic illness. Thank you.